Your early morning mentality is your every hour mentality. All gas, no brakes. Focus. Purpose. Power. Destined for the water, but confident everywhere else. A calming buzz before the storm, the truth of nature itself. You can't catch lightning in a bottle. There's a limit out there, but it's not with your gear. Unrelenting power delivery. Unparalleled weight savings. Keeping you on the water, whether you run a 9-9 or out scoping your best fun. In this rare air, there's power in the silence. It's a mindset, thinking only of the things that matter and freeing your mind from the things that you trust. Hey everybody, it's Monday night, Twisted Cat Outdoors live podcast. We've got a huge special guest on, Mr. Danny Sapp and his son, Tyler Sapp. We're going to talk about a lot of things we got coming up, answer your questions about anything. Again, uh, we had a little bit of a break, actually a little bit, doesn't, I mean like a few weeks, um, but still busy, a lot of things. So uh, you just seen a new Pro Guide commercial, they just released their new charger, so that's pretty awesome. I've had it in my boat for a few months, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, but while everybody's jumping on and we start getting into things with Milford and obviously peaking, a lot of things are peaking, uh, Memorial Day weekend, <clears throat> May 25th. We're going to get in, dive into that. We just got the video back from Brandon at daybreak for our, from our Fort Smith and, event, and it was awesome. So while everybody's jumping on, watch this quick recap video of Fort Smith, Arkansas, where we fished pools 12, 13, and 14 of the Arkansas River and Kerr Reservoir, which is Pool 15. Uh, awesome place down at the Bakery District. So check out this recap, and then we'll get the party started. Oh, oh look at the That's a big fish. Wow. Look at that. Hey, everybody. We're here at Stop 4 in Fort Smith, Arkansas, along the Arkansas River and also having Kerr Reservoir as an option. This is a nice area. We're down here at the Bakery District here in Fort Smith. There's vendors, they got two streets shut down uh, that we're gonna weigh in during their festival. They got bands all day, they got uh, pub crawls, everything you can imagine is going on here from kids to adults. We're gonna have a huge crowd, I can't wait. That's nine, our first This big way and something like we've never had here at the Bakery District. Again, a shout out to Twisted Cat Outdoors. We got another boat coming here shortly. This is cool. Isn't this cool, guys? This is great. Thanks everyone for coming out to our very first Bakery Street Race. Can't wait to see if these angles went out and caught, especially with the conditions. Again, like I said, thunderstorms Thursday changed everything. So if you were pre-fishing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you gotta throw it out the window and start over. So again, we'll see if these anglers can adapt, overcome the weather, the water, and get a good bag of fish. Oh, 
coming up in second place. We're really excited today. We got 33 teams and it's a beautiful day and we can't wait to see what they bring in. And now we get into some hardware, 99.79, shy of 100. Chris and Hunter Taylor, $1,320. 103.22, JT and Justin Ray, Robert Robinson, $1,980. Kelby Saki, Phelan Hogan, and Clay's Bray with 107.37, $3,960. But thanks everybody again. Hopefully we'll see you next year back here in Fort Smith. We're out. Man, that video gets me pumped up for some tournament catfishing. Uh, so awesome event. Hopefully we go back in 2025. But like I said, uh, I was talking to Tyler backstage a little bit. We're just kind of getting started. Even though we have four tournaments in out of 12, we still have a lot of things left. A lot of changes are going to happen, uh, especially in the points race, the Suzuki points race. Again, uh, only four out of 12. So still people can come in and really do good and jump in this points race. Again, we're taking the your best four out of 12. So if you fish four, we'll take those four. If you fish 10, we'll take your best four out of 10. And then your the top 50 anglers of the season <coughs> get invited to the championship. No entry fee in Helen, Arkansas right now at $25,000 plus. Um, again, so that's going to be a fun event. And like I said, there's a lot of things, a lot of other events besides Twisted Cat. You know, we got some CR owner stuff that we're going to be at. Um, fishing for freedom, Alton Classic. So this is a huge year. It seems like each year there's more and more things in catfishing uh, popping up, which is good, making the sport grow uh, as it's still in its kind of infancy stage. Just like Bass Masters that was just passed this weekend in Tulsa, huge event, been going on since the 70s. Um, that's always been my goal, to grow the sport, to grow this tournament side of things as big as we can. And as we grow the, the sport of tournament catfishing, it's going to help with, getting bigger sponsors in, um, more anglers in, and obviously um, trying to help um, with fish health, um, what we learn about that, um, getting states on board so we can have some good laws uh, protecting our species of catfish. So again, without further ado, let's bring in father and son duo, Danny and Tyler Sapp. How are we doing? What's up, guys? How are we doing this afternoon? <laughs> hey, my cough is, is getting better. It's getting <laughs> better. Uh, I've, I've got some cough drops, and I went in. I went downstairs. I got some honey. <laughs> I don't <I> like. <laughs> so I'm doing a little bit better than I was doing a little bit. I was on the phone with Sean Long a little bit ago, and then obviously Tyler and you and you were saying you got to do something. So. Um, I don't know. I feel a little bit better, but Hey, it's Monday night. We're live twisted cat outdoors. I don't even know how, what, if this, maybe we should start numbering these podcasts, but I try to put them up after also on YouTube. Um, again, like I told Sean on the phone, the goal is that I'm bringing value with people that come on the show that help anglers get into fishing, catch more fish, uh, learn about accessories, rods, boats, all that stuff. Um, but it's been a fun ride. So you boys have been on before and I got you on again. Obviously the focus tonight is <clears throat> to mess with Tyler a little bit about points and then obviously peaking. Um, for those of you that don't know, Danny is so instrumental. I can't even explain how instrumental uh, to making this event and peaking happen. You know, he's, he's asked me for a couple of years, come to peaking, come to peaking, come to peaking. And finally, we went last year. We kind of threw it on the schedule, I'd say, late. It was in August. Didn't really want it to be in August, but it just happened, and we had a great event. Hot. Um, I don't know. I can't remember how many boats. I think we were in the 30s. Is that right? 38. 38 boats, our first time in Pekin. It's a channel cat. Or you think, you think Illinois River, you think channel cat, but actually, you had some blues get weighed, and you had some really good flatheads. Yeah. But everybody said 
May, end of May, end of May. So we're going to go there end of May. And for the first time <coughs> in a while, the goal is I think we have some added money from some from people in this in the city. So not only is this going to be 100% payback, we're going to have some stuff on top of that. And there's so many other things going on, just like what you've seen that we did in Fort Smith. The goal is that we have the weigh-in where we have a crowd of people watching, wanting to get involved, wanting to go fishing with the guide or buy a boat, buy some rods, but get out there. And uh, what we've seen last year in May or in August that we didn't expect is, how, I mean, how many golf carts alone were there? Right. There, was, there, golf there was three <laughs> golf carts. We had over 350 people down there for the weigh-in, Alex. And we really, uh, we just didn't expect it, but it was underneath the bridge, downtown Pekin. It was beautiful. The right weather after, was good. It did rain on us a little bit. Yeah, terrible rainstorm, you know. So, uh, you know, that deterred, you know, some people. And <laughs> Yeah, Not we almost lost some of the food vendors, but at like once the weigh-in kind of started going, it kind of got, you know, it, it turned nice. Um, but there was so many cool things. Like I said, the dealership, uh, you know, that hanging out there the night before and then being a big sponsor and then kind of everybody just kind of hanging out, going downtown and eating with the mayor. I mean, the mayor was eating with the anglers downtown and that was pretty cool. So you, as people are starting to fish these twisted cat events and a lot of other events in catfishing, you're starting to see not only just anglers and their families, but you're starting to see these cities come together. Uh, I was in Fort Smith and the mayor came up, got on the mic and he took off walking down the line, talking to every <laughs> truck and, and boat. So, I mean, that's what it's about. They're starting to see it and that's what they're really enjoying. And like I said, that's that video really kind of portrays, you know, what all that entitles. And it's so much fun for the anglers to come and not just go to a boat ramp, have a tournament and leave. There's a lot more of that camaraderie and hanging out. Um, especially like what we're going to do in Pekin. And I think, Danny, you can <clears throat> talk about this a little bit, but we're looking to even have a band on Friday night. Yes, sir. Friday night, we're going to have a band. We'll have uh, food on uh, Friday and food on Saturday for all the participants and anglers for the captain's meeting. Um, we're going to, we're, we're, we're basically going to, we're going to shut that thing down like we did last year shut the whole parking lot down the boat ramp and we're going to, we're going to bring it in second to none. Um, I've worked very, very hard on this and it, it I, I, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm still working on it. Yeah. Uh, but I've been to two city council meetings. Um, they've all, uh, the, the, you know what? The sponsorship is amazing though. When you have the mayor yeah. backing you up, when you have Ray Dennison Chevrolet, which you I work for, um, when you have the city, <coughs> oh, Amy, uh, when you have that kind of backing, it just, it's amazing what you can do. It really, really is. And, and you were there in the meeting at the, at the one meeting of the city council, you and Liz, um, no, yeah. it, uh, it's, it's just, they're, they're so thrilled about this tournament. We're thrilled about this tournament. Everyone's thrilled about this tournament, and they should be, because it's going to be a tournament. Trust me, the best, one of the best ones there is. <coughs> yeah, Rob, just to show up at these tournaments. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rob. Any uh, anybody, uh, it can well, show up. Fish will help. You know, it's not like all of us don't help one another, and you know, best as as much as possible. You know. Come show up. Show your face. Yeah, and this is what kind of helps. Like I said, you know, years ago, there used to be a lot of events in north. When I say north, I kind of have like St. Louis is that line. You know, even you can catch blues up here, but like St. Louis seems to be that line where it's hard to draw guys south up. It's hard to draw guys north down. And, you know, when I talk to you guys about building this 2024 season, which you, the counter is a little haze from the blacklight, uh, <coughs> It's kind of region, so it's it pulls where you have to if you're gonna if you're gonna compete, you have to jump out of your region. You know, if you've got the let's say peak in Illinois River, Burlington, Muscatine, you really got to go out of that region to even get a fourth event. So, do you go to Kansas or the Missouri River or down to P uh, Perryville, 
um, New Madrid. So you, everybody's got to step out to become the best of the best and, and compete. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but like I said, and, and we, we cover a lot of different bodies of water and different times of year, you know, just like what we've done starting in Lake of the Ozarks. And Tyler, you had a really good showing, especially at Grand Lake. So we were talking also about points in the, in the back, in the background a little bit or in the backstage. And like Tyler says, it's really not even started because there's a lot of anglers that can still jump in and, and really run with it. And that's so true. I mean, <laughs> well, it's like the last, it seems like two or three events. You really see, you know, what, what your competition's going to be and where you rank amongst, you know, until then, you know, it's kind of up in the air because you got people that'll fish here, but it's not convenient. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, out of town and they might one or two, you know, kind of like, we didn't go to that one down at Fort Smith. It looked like a great tournament that we missed. But just unfortunately, see art coming up and all that fun stuff. You know, just got to put get your priorities straight. You know. Yeah, there's so many events. Like I said, you got to pick pick those certain events, especially to compete in. And you take even in Muscatines in August, peaking end of May, um, Burlington September. I mean, those are three I would say northern events that. You, know, you take some anglers up here that are very good. I mean, even like the Pharaoh, the Lud Keys, a lot of them that I haven't seen in a while, they can really step up. Uh, you got Dylan Lawson and Bo that's done well already, and they haven't even had tournaments in their backyard yet. They're traveling eight, ten hours to tournaments. Well, you got, you got, I'll tell you what, you know, and I haven't even spoke to him yet this year, but there's a man that's going to be on the hunt again this year by the name of Mike Keel, and he's going to be coming for that, you know what I mean? So you just – Everybody yeah. put, put your seatbelts on because the man is coming, you know. And that's, it's people like that you got to watch out for. And the Walsh brothers, Timmy and Tommy, they're 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 out. They're I mean they're out there to they're out there to do business. Yeah, they're that, and that's what's fun about. And it gives me like where I really excited to to put these events on because there's so much competition that's growing. Um, and you got the Browns and the Elliots. You can't forget about them, right? right. <laughs> oh, right. Phil, I love it. <laughs> um, but ma- there's so many good anglers out there, and and there and there's more coming. Um, and that's, that's just, what's fun. About it. Alex, this is such a growing sport. It is. It's it's. You know, um, I'm going on 60 years old. My son is a youngster. We have so many young newcomers coming into the sport that are help bringing this up. And yep. you know what? It, it's amazing how much they learn and how, and, and, and what they do to make it competitive. Um, not only for us older guys, but for the younger guys, but to bring the sport into their habit, you know, you know, and what about youth? I'm sure that you're used to dang near doubled or took two years ago. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to do so much for youth. Like I said, we're working a lot of things in the background to get them involved, even on our social, even like on the social media stuff to try to push towards them. Um, more youth, more women. Um, like I said, it's it's really growing fast. And what's really always kind of been my goal is obviously you want a lot of boats and anglers, but if you guys notice in the last couple of years, like I'm really pushing spectators, you know, like at the Alton Classic, I think we've had maybe a record show up there you know what i mean where we're giving prizes to the spectators i'll tell you what you were there in person at grand lake like we didn't even have a chance to spot like doing sponsored ads for spectators around town they did some stuff i'm glad we didn't like we needed it, parking control for spectators it was kind of cool because they overwhelmed the boats and everything you know they it was like <laughs> crowd they circled they all circled around the boat they wanted to see it, you know, it was like nothing i had seen before so it, i had it, spectators down there at grand lake hundred percent like grand lake grove was awesome and again that they just had obviously they have bass masters classic there so they know what they're doing but you know what's cool about grand is i'm very particular on how things look and feel and the the flow and at one point it's raining and all these people are showing up and i i moved the trailer you can ask liz and my dad probably three times like literally three times i moved the trailer <coughs> because you got wind and rain and all that and at, at one point i'm like I don't know where these people are going to stand. Like we had people standing almost inside the trailer watching the way in. I mean, it was crazy. And I could only use my phone vertical to do the uh, live feed, 
but it was just, I don't know. I really, there was something about that just being all up close and there were so many people there and they were like, just awesome. And it's really fun. <laughs> so let's see. So Stephen asked, will there be daytime or will there be some night later on? As of right now, I'm just not a big fan of night tournaments for several reasons. It's, you know, it's tough to pre-fish them. A lot of the anglers are traveling. Um, they can be kind of dangerous. And then you don't really, it's hard to draw crowds. And they're a lot of work because you kind of, they're almost a two-day event. I mean, really, you know what I mean? A night event. Alex, um, <laughs> don't talk to my son about pre-fishing. Yeah, I mean, Tyler can catch, I'm just, he's, <laughs> he's been doing good. But he can catch good fish the week of the tournament and then sometimes falls apart. <laughs> We've had this talk many a times, Alex. Oh, 100%. Um, Rob said, do you think TikTok plays a role in the growth of the sport? I don't know. I mean, I think social media plays a big role in everything these days, whether it's, you know, some people say, well, it costs a lot of money to go fishing or fish tournaments. Well, I mean, I've got friends that do, oh, the dirt track racing on Friday night and travel. And I'll tell you what. They don't even win money. Like if they win a trophy, like that's something. And they spent a ton of money on that. So I guess it's kind of what you're into, but you can learn so much now, you know, back in the nineties or whatever, you probably, it was tough to learn unless you read a book, you know, so you have some books out, but now you have social media, you got people going live all night, all day. You can watch what they're doing. We've obviously done some one-on-one -on -one tournaments. Uh, we're looking to do more of that, <laughs> especially like during the tournaments where we had four or five people on. You know, get to see what those anglers do because it's not just like what Bassmasters, and that's a perfect example, is they're not, not only are they live a lot, they are also have people out there watch. Like there's boats chasing. I know some guides that actually take people on guided trips only to follow certain anglers around just to watch them. Not even if they want to watch like how they're doing it or learn just because they've got to that level. Again, they've been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, like Phil said, we're kind of, it's a middle-aged sport, unfortunately, but we're still so, in my opinion, so early in this. We have so much growth we haven't even tapped into yet. And I think um, there's a lot of good people behind this sport that are helping push it to make it grow. Um, and that's, like I said, I can't, like, this is my 10th year doing it. I never would would have thought we'd be where we're at today, but it's just push, push, push. Um and it's crazy the money that's getting involved, the 100% paybacks. I mean, there's some people, <clears throat> I fill out those W9s, so I, there's some people making some good money um, yeah. doing that. I mean, a win here and a win there. I mean, that, you know, you're not going to make it, you're not going to make a living, but let's talk in five years and let's you're go right. back to this conversation. You know what I mean? I, I think you're going to start seeing some of them huge sponsors get in, and that's what's well, going to make a big change. And that's, and, and I agree with you 100%, Alex. <laughs> You have to admit, it is 100% about the sponsorship. It's 100% it's hundred percent about the community itself. You get these people in. Um, when you get, such as the mayor, um, Ray Dennis of Chevrolet, uh, the Amy from the City, uh, city Tourism Bureau, um, that go to these city council meetings to get the funding to be able to have this tournament here, um, it, 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 it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they they are actually there at the tournament. They're at the weigh-in, Alex. You met the mayor. You know what she is. You met Amy. Um, oh, 100%. 100%. They, 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 they loved it. They, I mean, they saw what we did last year in our first year. Our first year. We had over 350 people down there last year. It now, was insane. It, yeah, insane. It was nuts. It was nuts. And this year, it's going to be wow. Um, wow. I, 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 I've been working so hard on this, uh, getting the bendies in, uh, <laughs> getting the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, <coughs> the bands in for Friday night. Um, yeah. But we're, we're making it to where we're going to bring a lot of people out, let alone Memorial Day weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. So we're, we're, we're exploding this here in the city of Pekin. We are exploding it. Oh. In the city of Pekin. Yeah, it's, 
it's going to be big. It's a good time of year. Kind of school's getting out for a lot of kids. You know, again, Chad said, I thought you were, there were always way more cat fishermen than bass fishermen. How is turning cat fishing not bigger already? You know, again, as a director, I get to go to a lot of these cities and have meetings. And, and a prime example is what we just did in Fort Smith. So I accidentally came across Fort Smith, never even heard of Fort Smith, maybe in a movie or something. But me and Liz went to um, Tulsa to Keystone, checked it out, fished it. We already had it on the schedule. Went to Grand Lake, uh, hung out there. We had it on the schedule. This was for last year. And then went to Lake Washita for the championship. <coughs> well, on our way from Grand Lake to Washita, we were kind of going through the Arkansas River Valley, and we drove across the river and then came into this town. And I was like, this is a cool town along a river. I don't even know what river this is. Ended up staying the night in Fort Smith, woke up, checked it out. I'm like, this is cool. I talked to Lance uh, Ludkey and Dominic Pellegrino. They're like, yeah, Kerr Reservoir is right there, and it's a really good fishery. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. They're like, Kerr not is in Virginia? Or like, no, they're like, here, right here. I'm like, okay. So we did a little research into that, and I met with them. Luckily, one of the uh, the gals in the city of Fort Smith knows somebody that I work with in Tulsa. But when we went to the bakery district, so the bakery district is where we had the weigh-in. So my goal is always to get it away from the boat ramp, make it fun, make it fun for anglers, the family, spectators, the city. <clears throat> I sat down with them, and they thought I was crazy. Like, catfish tournament, weighing in here, like, that's – that's some redneck stuff. I'm like, it's it's not. So I showed them a video of some of the events, like in New Madrid, and they were like, okay, that's that makes a little bit of sense. But you could tell they weren't like super excited. They're like, I I can kind of read people. I'm thinking these. They're thinking this is crazy. Like, how do we not let them weigh in here? Like, let's not. And even come in the town before, they were just kind of a little hesitant. Then the tournament day came the night before people kind of come and hang out at the bakery district. They start to see the people talk to them. They're spending money in their establishments. And then the weigh in comes and the first boat shows up. So there's all these people around. Nobody kind of, they're just, they know there's a fishing tournament and there's, there's a decent amount asking what time are they coming in? We're here for the weigh in. But the people that didn't expect it are the ones that you hear like that wow when they pull the fish out so the first boat that weighed had some really good actually the first two boats and that is when people like just everything changed and it's all about catfish and then you you leave the town and then now you start hearing you know bakery districts puts a video out actually yesterday um and they're like we can't wait we hope they're coming back next year i'm like so like once you start doing that in these areas that's what really kind of helps grow and that's a perfect example Pekin, New Madrid, what we're going to do in Perryville. Every event has that kind of a little event that's going on with it, whether it's a car show or what we're going to do in Pekin. And that's our goal where it's also fun for the anglers. So Pekin is going to be huge. We're looking to have some added money, which is, is going to be awesome. But also bring your families and enjoy the weekend. There's stuff to do. There's a lot of things going on. The fishing should be good. Um, maybe Tyler can take, obviously Tyler can catch a good fish during the week of the tournament. So if you want to show up early and you bring your family, maybe have them go with Tyler instead of yourself so they can put them on good fish that week. Right. Sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah. So back to Pekin, it's, it's going to be another one of those. And again, now usually again, this was different because Fort Smith, you had to deal with Oklahoma and Arkansas have them on a Zoom meeting and say, hey, we're wanting to do this. If they fish in Oklahoma, they got to come to Arkansas to Fort Smith to weigh fish. And they're like, whoa, 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 well, you can't do that. I'm like, well, we got to do that. So then everybody had to get a sheet of paper and a permit to have in their truck so they could come in. Everybody could weigh fish, whether they're from Arkansas, Oklahoma. We had uh, Miller Fisheries there that put fish that were caught in a river in one of their tanks and a lake in the other tank and then had to take them back to the river and lake. So there's a lot of logistics behind the scenes that go on, but that's what makes the event fun. And again, that's kind of like in Pekin. What's the south boundary is the, what bridge is that? Beardstown. <laughs> so we have boundaries. 
in this event because if you could, I mean, technically you could probably go to Alton, right? Pretty easy. I don't know about pretty easy. No, no, no. no. Right, but yeah. You well, could, I mean, yes. Yeah. Legitimately, you could make you it. Could. Right. Yeah, yeah. You lose a lot of fishing time, but you could. So we say that uh, you can go to the Beardstown Bridge and up. Um, we'll have two ramp locations. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Just like last year, if you fished it last year, you'll have the Pekin boat ramp and Coochies. Coochies on the water. Um, boundaries that will remain the same they were from last year. We, we, we're we trying, what we're trying to do here, and, and you know, I had a couple of people say, well, why can't you let us put in down a van or not? Um, I have to <laughs> tell fishermen that don't have the 80 gallon gas tanks. I have to. I want to make it on a fair playing ground for everyone. And and that's the main thing is, uh, you know, you, the, the people that run 50 miles one way, 50 miles back or whatever, that's great. That, you know, you, you know, but if <laughs> but it is, you don't have a lot of boats don't have that big of tanks to be able to do that. Alex, you understand yeah. what I'm hundred percent. And like I said, then it keeps everybody kind of in that area. Um, fishing, you can put it. So Coochie's is actually above that lock and dam also, correct? Yes, sir. We'll have to figure out where Nate Blint put in and exactly how he was catching us. I heard that Nate Blint didn't turn his big motor on. I heard that also. I spoke to him in private, <laughs> but you know. So yeah, so in, in that that event's coming up again. You can register now. It's again three hundred dollars, three fifteen online. If you see me before that, it's three hundred cash, and then it'll be three twenty five cash during the event Friday, Saturday morning, or three forty online. Um, setting hooks and crossing eyes, Havana to what? So Havana is below or above no. Beardstown? Havana, well, not Havana. It's Beardstown up. up. So that, so setting hooks and crossing eyes, he's on YouTube. If people are asking, what they don't see that uh, comment. But he's, uh, we're referring to Beardstown Bridge. You're actually past Havana. That's actually lower than Havana. Yes, it is. Alex. <laughs> You think I'd be better at my geography? I'm really not that far from. I'm all, I'm really only about two hours from Pekin, and probably two hours from Havana. I'm kind of like right. I can go either way. There you go. Um, so Joseph asked Phil Brown if he needs a partner. Maybe we'll get Brown and Elliot because we can't forget Brown and Elliot and Pekin. Brown, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had a good showing in uh, Alton. So, I mean, you take them, he fished one tournament. So, far. he's only got one tournament in with like a sixth place finish or fourth or tenth. I'm not sure which one, but something like that. Right. <laughs> Is that true, Tyler, that they don't, if you don't win, nobody remembers what place you got? Pretty much. No such state uh, as a place. I don't fish for second, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I need to get is that uh, that movie where is it Will Ferrell where he says I don't know, maybe I can't play that on here but I need to get like a little I just click the button. <laughs> <laughs> hey Alex, uh, another thing is don't uh, let's uh, it's going to be a little different this year because we are holding the the captain's meeting at the riverfront on Friday. Not at the dealership. Not at Ray Dennis and Chevrolet. So pretty much everything will be at the riverfront. Yes. Everything. <laughs> yes. We're going to allow the open public, the general public, to be down there. That's why I'm bringing in a band, Alex. It'll be Friday. The captain's meeting will be big. The tournament will be huge. Um, yeah. And yeah, we're also going to do a Calcutta. We, we try to do Calcutta at some of the events, the bigger events. Yes. Um, and that's, yeah. Rob, the rules are posted on uh, TwistedCatOutdoors.com. And then if you go to each registration, if you click the registration link, like if you're going to go to Pekin, go to registration, click Pekin. It'll pull up another deal where it also has live results, host hotel information, all that stuff. So 
I should have the host hotel info and all that updated this week for Pekin. Um, <clears throat> there's several hotels there, but again, it's Memorial weekend. A lot of you anglers wait till like Thursday afternoon on your drive to the tournament to book your reservation. And the problem since COVID, a lot's changed where hotel prices have went up. So when I negotiate a rate, like at Fort Smith, we had 107 at the Wyndham. It, they can only hold it for so long because then they're if they're blocking rooms and they, they're losing. Um, so then they open that up like two weeks out. So you kind of got to get ready um, for that. <clears throat> um, Tom says he's going to dance on the pedestrian bridge river overlook. Okay. I'd like to see Tom dancing. Which, I'm not which sure. Tom? We're back. Talking about here. I'm a photographer, Tom Souls. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you meant Tommy Walsh. I was going to say, I'd love to oh, see that. Yeah. You know what I'd love? I'd love to see Tommy Walsh and Tommy Stoles both dancing. <laughs> if that happens Friday night, then there was a lot of fun to be had. Let me tell you that right now. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'd pay money to see that one, Alex. I really would. I'd pay money. Yeah. No, it's uh, it, it's going to be a, a great event. Um, even, you know, even my partner, Sean Kelly, my brother, Jeff, could not believe it last year what we did with that last year for our first year coming in um and they know how, how hard i work at it well and it, <laughs> it's, it's something you strive to do you know you, you strive at it to make it alex me and you have been together and talked about this and we talk on the phone and everything and you came up here for the city council meeting and we did it we we've, we've achieved our goal yeah. all right to say that is a lot. Is a lot. <coughs> um, who was closest on weights of big fish in the total weight from Fort Smith tournament? I want to say it was Cassie. Um, but I'm gonna double check on that, Clyde. We had like two or three different uh things going on guesses, <coughs> which I got to send a few more hats out. So for those of you, uh, yeah, I'm still waiting. Um, yeah, well, we are, I don't, you win? we're holding, we're holding our breath. Just kidding. I think you guys, I think you guys guessed after the weigh-in. It didn't say when, though. You know, <laughs> this is like these guys guessed at nine. These guys guessed at nine forty-nine Saturday evening. I'm like, yeah, that's them. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might want to put Liz in charge of that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, bro, you got you got gas in that generator yet? Yes, I do actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to make me some coffee, you know, on the next go around. <laughs> hey, I need to get me a little machine like that. That was sweet. So at Alton, at like four in the morning, I I get there and Tyler says. Hey, you get your generator? It's like, I want to make some coffee. And I fired it up and just enough gas to make a couple cups. Three three cups. Me, you, and Bo each got a full cup. You know? And she died. Awesome. Yeah, we ran her empty. No, that was some good coffee. There's nothing better than coffee when you really need it. You know what yeah, I mean? Absolutely. Um, so on, on the tournament in Pekin, end of May, What's let's talk about like fishing. Is it going to be? We might have a little bit of current with some rain. We might have some water moving. So is it going to be a bump bite, anchor, dragging? What's kind of your thoughts on that in the May compared to how it was in August? So that's <laughs> depend on rain flow this next month. We've uh, we've had a lot of rain and uh, our dam's been down. And when our dam stays down for a significant amount of time, it allows good current flow and allows them blues to want to come up. You know and and uh, if we maintain that, you know, it should be a really good, really good bite. As far as dragging, it's probably it's probably I don't want to say you can't do it, but it's probably just a little bit too much to get, you know, for dragging. You know, you could get away with bumping. The flathead bite the flathead bite will become a lot. 
will be fire. Yeah, yeah, it will be. It will be good. And 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 here's the thing, Alex. Our blue cat fishing has gone up in the last five what, five years. It's really. I mean, it's really came out uh, came up. Uh, what do you think? Thinks behind that. Yeah, there's been some nice blues coming out of here. What'd you say? What do you think's changed <coughs> to making that bite, that blue cat bite, come in uh, uh, an effect a little bit more? You know, I feel like, you know, just from group talk and listening to people, you know, from the Alton area, yada, 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 it seemed like them, them cats stayed a lot below the Alton Dam, and now it seems like they've they've gotten past that barrier, and and I don't know if that's the reproduction has been great in the pool above them that's allowing them, to, you know, to disperse more. But it's somewhere, something along them lines, I feel like. You know, because, you know, they migrate up to my pool up in pool 20. Um, and we've not had a lot of water the last couple of years. We've had a lot of low water. So I wonder if that can affect it. You know, but then you talk to like Max DeBay, Seth Mackelow, and they say that the blue cat bite's getting better in pool 19, which I think they're just weighing some spawned out males. But what do you guys think? You think there's blues in pool 19? I no, I don't I wouldn't know that I, yeah. I don't have too much <coughs> on that body of water you know what I'm saying I haven't no. been on it too no much. I haven't been on it enough to tell you I really haven't but yeah I, I've not weighed a blue in ten years there but uh, you know between Seth and Max always catching them they say so right. I don't know one of these days Seth's gonna show me up I guess we'll see right right now what now that's the Quincy pool right. No, pool 19 is uh, the Fort Madison pool. And really? Okay, so now I, I lied to you. And I thought that was the one below it there. Um, that's impressive, you know. That really is. Yeah. Here. No, pool, pool 20 is my pool. That's literally 20 yards behind where I'm sitting. And there are blues in here, big blues. I think uh, Cody Vickers caught one over 80 pounds last year. Oh, okay. really? <laughs> but it doesn't get a ton of pressure. Not a lot of people fish for blues up here. I mean, not a lot of people – a lot more people are catfishing for sure, but not, you know, they're not right. Not that crazy, you know what I'm saying? But definitely people are, are chasing them. Donald's said he's never seen a blue in pool 19. So, but like I said, that's good that you guys are seeing some more population. And, and again, if, if you've seen some of the podcasts where I have uh, uh, Jim Lamer with Western Illinois, Illinois University, <laughs> where they used to, do you guys remember when? They did studies on the blues for two wow. two years of my events. So every tournament, this uh, graduating class came to every event uh, for two years that had blue cats. And after I weighed them, <coughs> they took the weight that I weighed them, they measured them, did a diet sample, tagged pretty much all of them, and then released them. And then they had a lot of cool studies on their migration and all that stuff. I still need to get that. <coughs> Her name was Ashley Stanley. Um, but it was some crazy information on like what they were, you know, because you always hear blues that they're eating shad in the cold months. And then it, it, it switches to the, the moon eye and the skipjack and all that stuff. And I don't know. There's a lot of information. Maybe I shouldn't get too many, too deep into it. But I'm, I'm going to try to get maybe her on one of these podcasts. Um, and like I said, every little thing you can learn about that. Because what do you guys? What's your guys' thoughts? Actually, been fishing a long time on a blue. Let's say that you're going to go to Alton in March or Alton in September. Are you guys using the same bait? March, July, October? No, no. no. <laughs> so why is that? <clears throat> well, because man, a man once told me, you know, a certain water temperature for each bait. And you follow that. And I started following that because it seemed like that's the forge for the time of year. You know, you know, and just a little tip, if you can piece together on why that that, that is happening, it'll, it'll take you a long ways, you know, kind of like you were asking. So, like, if I was to go in March, everybody's like, skip jack, skip jack, skip jack. And I'm not taking no skip jack. I'm going to have fresh shad and the freshest I can get. Cause that's what I feel like is the best kind of bait that time of year. Now you put me at the end of the year, it's going to be, you know, that you said September, you know, that's kind of the verge between, you know, going from a midnight to my eyes, you know? So, you know, I'm going to have both of them baits and, you know, the freshest I can get them. 
And I have to agree on that, 100%. I, I do. <coughs> and that's, that's I wasn't good. Away from Asian carp either. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in those guys. The Asian carp in our river system put a big damper in the shad population. And uh, I feel like that's a huge for, you know, food forage for them blue cats nowadays. And it's an easy target. I mean, easy. And, yeah, and one of the samples, it, it said that they were like 96% of their diet was carp. Yes. Yes. That's a yeah. lot. That is a lot. That is a lot. I agree. But it's just like when we held uh, the tournaments the last two years over in Iowa. You know, we always fish those early tournaments, Alex, and we've had two years that it was terrible weather. But um, you, you, unless you had shad, you didn't catch nothing, you know. But yet you turn <laughs> around and where we run it now, and now you're going to run a totally different bait situation. Yeah. Everything changes. Every, every month changes. It does. So with Channel Cat, again, like right now, I would say shad guts are like gold. So everybody's been asking shad guts, where do I get shad guts at? And like, I don't even know if anybody's selling them. If they're selling them, it's crazy money. I mean, it's like uh, crazy money. So are shad guts that important that you won't, will you fish a tournament without shad guts in March and pool 19? Yes, I you know, if I had to, but I, I tell you what, I'm going to be breaking, breaking my bank to go find some type of shad to cut a gut out of somewhere in the state. You know what I mean? Somewhere in the surrounding states, something I'll, within hours, I'll be going because that's what I will have this time of year. Yeah. Uh, Tom just asked if Adam got the details on the tagged fish at Alton. Did he have a tagged fish at Alton or at? Yeah, was that Alton? That was Alton. Yeah, and uh, I hadn't heard anything. He's on vacation right now, so he's... He, that dude is always on vacation. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. Oh. Uh, Scott Rupert, the Roop Tube, said, I have seen two blues on 19 in Montrose. So he's seen them. Uh, there, then there's probably some there. You know, and when there's current, you probably agree with me. Well, if there's a way to get there, you know, it's got the sustainable, sustainable water conditions for it, you know, for them. But no, yeah, I just, and I'm going to share this is this and this could be Seth messing with me, but he had sent me this picture and I he said he had caught two blues. And I'm just going to show the picture, but <laughs> and I don't know. I don't think they're blues. If you pull them up here. I don't believe those. I are don't blues. think those are blues. That one looks so like a big, the one in his left hand looks like a big male, big old males, you know, bulkheaded channel. Huh. <laughs> yeah. But Hint, uh, but Max DeBay is another one that's caught several. I think he said he's caught a twenty or thirty or something like that. Um, you know, I I I think I'm, guys are messing with me, but I don't know. The biggest I heard around here last year, they had a 28, you know, up in Lake, you know, at a tournament that I believe was a St. Jude tournament or something like that, you know, but there's a lot, you're not going to come here and catch a 60 or 70. So don't think that, you know, I'm not saying that's not possible, but it's the likeliness just isn't there. Now for you to come down, come here and catch a 30 pound flathead, 40 pound flathead, not out of it <laughs> at all. At all. I was gonna say we've seen some we've seen some good ones. Yeah, yeah. No, we we were firsthand familiar with Alex with what the flathead uh, come to in size here, and uh, majority of the fishermen around here uh, they know that there's some big flathead. There's some big flathead. But this time here, good blues, good blues too. <laughs> so, uh, I sent you. This some might message. be. You know, yeah, this might be the best comment uh, so far of the night, and this is hilarious because Dylan, what what pool are you in? So Dylan's up by Muscatine, and he said people catch blues here all the time. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. 
what state is 19 in, Rob? So uh, that is Iowa, right between Iowa and Illinois. So <coughs> right below pool 19 is pool 20, where it splits the <coughs> state of Missouri and Iowa. Where So just behind me, the Des Moines River dumps into the Mississippi. So people will catch blues up at the Ottumwa Dam, uh, a ways up the Des Moines River, but it's hard to even boat up there. You know, there's been so much kind of with the flooding, it's put a lot of stuff. It's hard to get up there by it, unless you maybe have like a jet boat. Um, right. <clears throat> so Joe said there were a couple blues released in pool 19 of the Cabela's Classic out of Fort Madison. Farrow caught a couple below and Phil King caught one below also that was released in pool 19. So, <clears throat> and that's true. I guess I caught a decent, I caught maybe a 20 pound blue last June. So our fishing for freedom, we always release the fish right there above in that canal. Um, you know, talk with Jim Lamer, something about the ear bones of these fish. Like they did a lot of studies where if you release them, they will, whatever means necessary, they make it back to where their, their home is, I guess, whether that's below. And they've done some studies on between 19 and 20, where even silvers, they would, catch some below or above on 19, bring them down to 20 and they would lock back through the dam, which is blows my mind to get back up to pool 19. I, I just think that's crazy. That is nuts. That's nuts. <laughs> but you think of a silver as not being a very intelligent fish, but I don't know. So it's, there's, there's a lot of uh, deep stuff in that, which I would, you know, learn some more about that. And like I said, I, I just messaged Ashley um so she said she's gonna get that all put together for me and and have something so i can have that next monday night um her studies and all that stuff dylan said pool 16 so like i said that's what's unique is you've got pool 20 in the summer and the, you know from july august early september can really be on fire and look at the way and we've had it jack and jill that really shows you if you take jack and jill which is always the the labor day weekend the weekend before Alton and you look at the results and then you go next weekend to the Alton classic, they always kind of are the same. So one year, if you guys remember this, I think it was the first year of the Alton classic, no boats over hundred pounds. We did have a really big fish, but I think first place was like 92 pounds, 96 pounds. What was interesting is the weight we had the weekend before, which is, Alton is pool 26. This is pool 20 and 21. Just destroyed. We almost weighed more fish with like 40 boats in Canton, Missouri for a Jack and Jill than we did 100 boats at the Alton Classic. <laughs> Big fish was like 74 pounds right. in pool 20 of a Jack and Jill tournament. Right. So those, if for anybody that thinks those fish don't migrate and migrate rapidly, they're crazy. I mean, that's definitely studies have been shown and you can even just watch the tournament results and see, and we've, we've had a tournament in Quincy in pool 21 where no blues were caught at the end of September. It was almost like they were just disappeared or something. What was big fish down in Alton? That, that year? This year. What was big fish? 106. No, 103. 103 yeah. just had it in March. At the Alton Classic 106. So we've weighed 200 pound fish in the last, I mean, two tournaments in Alton. That tells you and about total, it. Wow. total three. So the only three fish I've ever weighed over 100 pounds have came at the Missouri Mississippi confluence, that area, the lower Missouri right. River, Mississippi River. Uh, right. Yeah. <coughs> Phil Brown says we need a flood. I disagree because I live on the river. I'm done sandbagging for a while, okay? It's been a little bit since I sandbagged, but we did not lose this place, but in 2008, we fought it for about a week and lost it. That was brutal. Probably about like 9 o'clock at night. We had, you know, we had big cement blocks, those big ton blocks stacked on each other like three high. And it just the saturation behind those blocks with all the sandbags and stuff um, to went. And when they went, the way the water came in the house was just insane. So, uh, and I don't wish a flood on anybody. So, 
Hopefully, if it floods, it's a light flood. Let's hope it's like a light flood. We also had last year to where we had <laughs> boat ramps out of the water. You couldn't put your boats in in certain places. It was yeah. terrible. Everybody was complaining, you know, and it, it's Mother Nature. It is <laughs> Mother Nature. We have no control over it. But, yeah, um, last year was probably one of the worst years as far as boat ramps I've seen. Yeah, and Tyson Emery said the Mississippi up here looks lower already than than last summer. And he, like I said, I've already been doing a lot of traveling, and, and he's right, and that's what scares me. Granted, we've had a ton of rain the last couple of days, but wow, I'm I'm nervous. If it stays like this, and we don't get a lot of water, we're not going to have we're gonna we're gonna be rough, rough finding boat ramps. And like you say, you, you know, uh, that year at the Cape Girardeau Championship, you know, we had my dad and Seth putting fish in a tote hauling them across to a sandbar and then walking them across to get them back in the river. Um, so yeah. hopefully we have enough water. I was a part of that. That that was when Charles <laughs> Doug caught that second biggest fish and I had to truck that sucker about 800 yards across that island and I thought I was going to have to back. Yeah. That was rough. That's And Sean just said there was a 106 waiting for the Nikki Mathenia, Vicky Mathenia Memorial Fish Off last summer. So like I said, Alton, known for giants there's obviously a reason the most you know the most fish and i think the record was that a five fish limit that uh or three fish that jackson and wolf and them where they had that ridiculous way in in october in grafton um that's pool 26 also so like i said it's uh, a lot of good fish in that area it's so much different bodies of water with the illinois the mississippi and missouri coming together the canal the chain of rocks there's a lot going on down there <laughs> Joe said three fish. I gotta look that up, but I think they were about to give up in Grafton. And they, the Grafton always has like a little city tournament. And I think the the story is they were it was like I don't know one o'clock in the afternoon. They hadn't really caught much. They were laying on the just like chilling, kind of over it. And then one go, rod goes down, like eighty eight, and then another rod goes down, another giant. And it was just it all happened so fast. Um, crazy weight, like two something, I guess, in three. Um, a lot of big fish have been caught. Like I said, the three over 100 I've weighed in there, several over 90. Actually, yeah, several over 90. So, yeah. Jake, Jake and then what had a 90 and an 80? Yeah, <laughs> and then that, their third fish was six pounds. Yeah, that don't matter at that point, you know what I mean? No, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> At that point, six pounds is six pounds, you know. I mean, poor Jordan. I feel so bad for that that guy, you know. He, he, what did he lose by three pounds or something, you know? Just needed one little kicker fish, you know. That's the heartbreaker. And, and that's, that, I mean, yeah, I think he's getting that fish mounted, but it was 103. It's a good-looking fish, but it doesn't even matter. At that point, you got big fish. I mean, if you win the tournament, obviously you want to win. But like, there's a kind of a story like, you know, you if if you didn't catch that, what would you have? Like, you caught that good one, and like I said, that's that's a long. I got a long ways to go to catch one that big. My my PB is still 76 down from Wheeler, so. Yeah, I, I think mine was last year. It was like six, a little over 65, almost 66 pounds. So. All you can do is go up. <laughs> you got time to beat it, Alex. I'm gonna try. I'm going to try. I'm ready. Uh, you know, CatCon always kind of starts the year for me. There's so much going on, and the weather has been crazy. It's been really, like, before CatCon in February, I thought we're going to have a, a really nice year. It stayed warm, and then it went down, and now it's kind of cold and rainy, and we're in the 50s and sometimes in the 30s at night. Uh, the weather looks good. My plan is to get out Saturday at least to mess around. I did some stuff to my boat, and uh, – I put live scope on it, see if that can help me catch some bait um, and kind of dial things in. I might take Rhett and see if we can't catch some of them. Uh, as Max DeBay says, pool 19 blue cats. Have you, um, run, have you ran out and run that live scope yet a little bit? No. So I haven't ran it on my boat at all. Um, I had Hammerhead Sonar Brent and his family at Hammerhead down in Kentucky install the live scope just because I wanted him to do it because he has this uh, deal called the visualizer that this sounds crazy to me. And I'm going to have to have him on to explain it, but live scope 
from the factory runs at like 12 volts. And this visualizer that you put between your battery and the black box takes it from 12 to 28 volts. And I guess it can take up to 32 volts. And that makes it give you a really good, clear picture. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I did go with Crappie Kirby on a crappie little fishing adventure in Kansas and got to see live scope use it for the first time. And it took me about a day to really like, I was like, this is so hard because how do you know, like what's what? And then I, he would be like, pull fish, fish. I'm like, what? And he would literally tell me I had a fish on before I knew I had a fish on. I'm like, that's crazy. But then I started to get it and understand it. Um, so it's fun, but you know, the question is, will it help the sport of catfishing? I don't know. I think for bait, 100%. I agree. Um, other than that, I think some people can spend too much time targeting one fish and you don't have, it's just time is key. Um, but we'll see, you know what I mean? Time will tell. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. I think when it comes to bait, though, it is. It's a. It's it's great, but you can't sit there and concentrate on it. A fish that's down there and expect him to bite. I'm sorry, I just can't. No, and at, and you don't want to spend too much time. And I I know like uh, Donald Moore is talking about getting live scope and asking about mounts and all that stuff. And like I said, <clears throat> it'll be interesting. There's a lot of people getting in it. And just like Ruger said, that's a game changer for bait. I've seen some videos on catching bait. Actually, I was with Tommy Vaughn. He took me and my dad out at Grand, and he was showing me like, you know, he threw his net out, and you can actually watch it go down and the bait go in it, and it closes up. Like, that is what's cool. <clears throat> uh, Jerry's definitely messing with me. Jerry's saying, no, it will not help catch catfish. Jerry sleeps too much on the boat to catch catfish, in my opinion, but um, he says live kill. What's that? <laughs> um, yes, people already doing it. All you need is the right three. So, yeah, I, that's that's right, right, Rodney. Um, like I said, we'll see. I mean, I think that you're gonna, it's gonna be kind of quiet. I know Bass is talking about it in a big way. I've seen some of them have five live scope transducers on their boats. And they're even putting them on their jack plates, which I don't understand that yet. I will figure it out. But they're even kind of like almost using live scope as a side scan. But I, I can't picture it because from what I've seen it, you have to really be able to see it fast. And again, will that fish that you mark bite? I know some crappie anglers that are spending a, you know, they spend so much time chasing that one fish that doesn't bite. And then they have a rough day. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 can, I yeah. Alex, I believe in the side scan. I really do. And download imaging, I believe in that. I really do. Uh, not just as far as a fish, but for structure. Um, but I don't know enough about the scope. I, I, I really don't. I've heard people talk about it. They say it's great. They locate fish, but it doesn't mean you're going to catch them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Oh, 100 percent Like I said, I and I've I've I'm running the Garmin GPS units. What I was gonna do tonight, but I couldn't get it hooked up in time, is I can run HDMI out of that sonar into my computer and show people like on this, I can make it a screen or make it big and show people what I'm looking at. So hopefully when I can get on the water maybe this weekend and kind of do that and show people what live scope looks like. And I think until you see it in person, it's hard to understand. You know, I know you've got different, you know, views, perspective and all that. Um, I don't know. Like I said, there's so much technology and there's been this conversation has been going on for years. I mean, from when they went to the 2D to the side scan and all that stuff. And now we're just a live scope. So, I mean, who knows what's next? Right. Exactly. Well, and that's what you don't know. You know everybody talks about we, we're going to wait till next year because they're going to come up with another upgrade. And that's right. They are. They're going to come up with another upgrade every year. Hundred percent. That's and Clyde said that's a good thing. Clyde said too many people are con concentrating on electronics and not reading the water, <clears throat> and that's yeah. important to, to really understand. You know, if you're reading, if you got to read the water to kind of know what those fish are doing, 
Um, if you're not reading water and you don't know, and that's, I was literally, <coughs> I was driving today and thinking in my head about a tournament, uh, my, just my last year of fishing. And I've so many of those, I want to say old timers, but that sounds terrible. Some of the, the veterans. I'm one of those. I've, I know. And, and they, so many say, Hey, get a notebook. And when you go fishing, if you're, especially if it's not a tournament, because at a tournament, you can kind of take all that knowledge really fast. But if I go out Saturday and I go to pool 19 and I go channel cat fishing and I don't catch a fish, then to me, fishing was crap. It wasn't my fault. It was, it was a bad day. But if you put a tournament on this Saturday in pool 19, five boats are going to have the time of their life. What did they do different? So you can start jotting that stuff down. Or even like I said, if you go out and have a good day, you know, water level was 16.2. There was flow at the dam. Uh, this is the temperature, the bare the pressure. So you can you can jot that stuff down. And I know personally know a few anglers, and I believe that's what's helped them is they have a notebook. They won't share it with me. They just tell me. And every time they go fishing, even if it's bait fishing from on on bait, which is really smart if you think about it. They're writing all that stuff down. So, like, if they're, let's say it's Wednesday, they're going to go fishing Saturday in a, in a tournament. They can say, okay, well, I know that the conditions are going to be this. So, now I know I don't need to go here, here, here. I know that my bait should be here. And that saved them time on the water because now they can go to where they've, the history of their book and catch that bait. Right. <laughs> And I've been doing this now like 13 years and I'm still not writing out that dang notebook. So, I mean, it, this is like how empty mine is still. But like I said, it's putting the time in, putting the work in. And those are the anglers that really, it's all the small details to make you a better angler. Exactly. 100%. 100%. Exactly. Um, and just like Dylan said, you can see the fish not bite before you get there. Future scope. Sean said documenting trips is gold. So are you, let me ask you this, Tyler, do you document your trips? Yes and no. I don't go to a crazy extent, but I do have a notebook put away. I'll be right back. That yeah. I, I usually try to document, you know, about seven or eight different, different things. So I, at one of my tournaments on like a Thursday night, I showed up and I was at the hotel checking in and there was a guy outside in his boat. Okay. And he was writing stuff down. I'm like, what in the world is he working? Like, what's he doing? He was literally <clears throat> writing down his Thursday. <clears throat> and I was, I was, just, I didn't like try to look in, but I was just kind of talking about it. And that's where I learned like this angler has got a lot of good info. And he was explaining like how he broke it down. So like, and the goal is that it saved him time in the future. Like it has, like, especially on his big thing was bait. Cause like bait can be really tough certain times a year. And he learned so much from just like flow, uh, you know, water temps going up and down. Because like I said, especially this time of year, you might have 50 degree water Tuesday. And by Saturday it's down to 46 because of a cold front. Like, what did those fish do? So he learned that. So he already knew what to do come Friday if he couldn't get bait on Thursday with 50-degree water temp. But Friday was 46. He was already making that move and not spending six hours spinning his head around looking for bait. Um, that's the, so that, and that's, that's huge. That's a big thing on, like, you know, I live right, right here on the river. With the dam in between us, you know, you out what what the fluctuation is going to be you know if they throw the dam up and slam the water down well you can probably bet that you don't need to be going below the dam to try to get bait most of the time you know you need to go up above where the, the water's leveled out a little bit and a little <laughs> bit so yeah i i totally agree with the notebook situation but like i said that goes back to when we were talking about bait temps you know i had a guy once all down no matter what yeah, Dylan said, I have to use a tape recorder because I can't read my own handwriting. That's hilarious. Well, and that and phones. I mean, nowadays you take a picture and everybody's like, oh, you're the picture king, da 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 da. Well, what they don't know is that's personal information for down the road. Because it's going to let me know come or May from two years ago or May from five years ago, hey, 
you were up here on this flat, and yeah, you'd like to think you remember everything, but you don't, you know. So any anybody watching on the podcast tonight or in the future, do you what is your like technique? Do you have a, a something you do? Do you have a notebook? Um, let us know in the comments. I'm kind of curious if people are, are taking information, are you using a recorder. Are you telling your buddy? Like, what are you doing? Or because I think that's a huge thing that people don't do. And I think that just everybody's always in a rush and just like, oh, I'll do it when I get home. And you don't do it. Then you forget about it. <coughs> so I'm going like, really, you go blind back every time you go out. You know what I mean? Pretty if you much. don't have information recorded. I mean, you think you can remember back two years ago, but I can't remember what I did yesterday. You know? Bill Brown says, I write down air temp, water temp, hum humidity, pressure, what the sky looks like, and water clarity. That's a good one. That's really good. I'd say uh, it's pretty close to right where I'm at, Mr. Phil. I usually make sure I do I date everything also. <laughs> Chris White's got a notebook. Randy's got it starting a log book. Um, taking pictures of my garment, especially side scan. That has water temps and everything on it. That's actually pretty good. Uh, taking pictures. You can really take a picture of your sonar, <clears throat> whether it's your side scan or whatever. That'll have all your, your water temp and all that. And then you can put it like in a notes on your phone. You probably want to lock that in case somebody takes your phone and then put it, you know, all the other information below that. <coughs> Google Workspace on my phone. I started a notebook several times, but always forgot to write everything down. That's that's issue. Um, data without meaningful analysis is, is not that helpful. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think every time you take a note that you can look back at, you can remember. You know what I mean? And that's what's huge. Bison said, taking pics every time I of my screen different times a year. Tyson, did you take any pictures in Alton in March? Kind of seeing how he, him and his team came down and Alton and fished. And I'll tell you what, Alton was a tough cookie, wasn't it? No. The water. Well, no, I tell you what, it, what killed me and I, and everybody say what they want, but I could down and pre-fish the weekend four, okay? That sun, that high sun, we couldn't we couldn't do nothing. We got that partial cloudy during the middle of the week when we come back, and man, it just it cranked up. And we know we we tried a little bit different stuff from what we were doing the time before, you know. I'm like, all right, all right. That high sun come back tournament day, and it was just you know our bite vanished again. So it was just really weird. Bobby Lee said he has a notebook on Illinois River dating back about 10 years. Bobby Lee, is there any chance you would share that notebook with me for don't, an hour? Don't do it. Bobby, don't do no, it, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby don't. No. <laughs> Bobby, just me. I just want to add it to my. It'll fast track <laughs> my Illinois River fishing. Okay? Come on. Help a we brother out. We have been with Bobby Lee so many times. We've shared motel rooms. We've, yeah, and no, Bobby, don't share. <laughs> <coughs> That's and another I, team, Bobby I, and uh, Kyle I, Johnson. I mean, them guys are dangerous. They had a hell of a tournament finish at Pekin last year. Didn't they get, like, what, second, third? Did they not win it? Did they win? I, I can't, you know. I thought they got. I thought they got. I think that I don't know. They were way up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bobby Lee's a good fisherman. Alex. Hey, Bobby yeah. Lee, I love it. He says I can tell you what Tyler weighed back in 2012, March through September. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, and I'm going to tell you right now. Anybody watching. Might not know Bobby Lee. He's the well, he's the owner of Chiller Bait Tanks. But him and Kyle together, if you see them at a tournament, you better watch out. You guys agree with that? I agree, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. 
I mean, these guys were doing some crazy techniques years ago. I remember when they were, I, I better not say because they told me under secrecy, but they were doing some pretty cool fishing techniques that I thought was crazy. Uh, obviously, it wasn't crazy. Um, and I've been on, I've been in the morning alongside him sitting in my boat at five o'clock in the morning with him with his headlamp on and watching him rigs, rig up poles that I've never seen rigged like that in my entire life. Yeah, no, Bobby Lee is, uh, yeah, he is, he, he's good. He's good. Yeah, no, he's there. There, he's very good. Like I said, it's, uh, I love when anglers like that fish too. I mean, like I said, it makes the whole, it makes everybody better as a whole, you know, when there's the best of the best out there fishing and, and running it back. You know what I mean? Like I said, it's, uh, that's going to be a, Pekin's going to be fun. I'm ex hopefully Bobby Lee and Kyle come out to that. And, um, we're going to have some of them OGs in Pekin, aren't we? Danny. Danny, do you consider yourself an OG? No. Oh, I don't know. Tyler, what do you think? I don't I'm know. Say, no, he's <laughs> been around long enough. I, I've been, been around way well, long enough. The problem of it is, Alex, is I've been out of it now going on two years because of, you know, health issues. And I'm, I'm hoping to get back up running this year. I really am. Uh, and, and trying to. But no, uh, there are just too many good fishermen out there. There, there, there is the the sport has grown so big. It's just like you were talking about earlier. Um, you got a lot of these young anglers, like right here, that are coming up the sport, and they're they're they, what they're doing though, Alex, is they're it's learning. They're learning from the older people that have been doing it for years. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're learning, and you go to tournaments and you stay in the motel rooms and stuff, and you travel and you sit there and talk to these guys. You learn, you listen and learn. You can never stop learning, ever, ever. <laughs> well, I, I got, agree. 100%. I got two things to say. I would love when you were saying OG. There's one OG that I consider that I would love for to be here, and that's Mr. Mark Farrow himself. That is the OG of the Illinois River, along with Brian Espy. You know, I, I, those those two guys are the OGs. I'd love to see them two guys show up. You know, I really would. Um, I'm gonna tell you, that's Mark Farrow and his and and Brenda, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. They won. I don't know that they lost a Burlington tournament for like five years. They're no joke. No, you know, no, no joke. They have, no, I don't think they lost a Burlington tournament. No. And I wouldn't be surprised if they ever do it, Alex. That's how good that's how good Mark is. You Mark, know uh, uh, one of the guys that got me into this catfishing knows Mark. And that's what he said. He's like, that dude can read the water. Wow. It's amazing. I mean we we fished against him so many times. And what an outstanding angler, though, Alex. I mean, he's he's class, class up, class up. Yeah. And now he's guiding, you know what I mean? So, I mean, uh, you know, and that's the thing is you didn't have, there's so many things that have changed over the years. You know, when I had that fun podcast with uh, old Dieter, you know, Dieter doesn't, uh, he doesn't understand our life or our way of how we're, how we're doing things, but like, you know, back then you didn't have all these guides you have now that can take you out and kind of fast track what you're learning. I mean, look at what Casey's doing in St. Louis. I mean, now he's got Mark Farrow guiding for him. You can go learn a lot in a day from Mark Farrow. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah. that's what's awesome. Hey, all uh, have, just let me be the bait bitch, you know. I'll just sit back and learn, you know. <laughs> so Bobby Lee said September 9th, 2017, Tyler Sapp, Phil Johnson weighed 48 pounds in for the win. Water temp 70 degrees, river level 11.98. That's dude, I'm telling you, that is the information that makes you a great angler. Well, that, that goes back to Mark. He, he taught me that back in the day, you know, you write everything down, everything, no matter what. Even if you don't catch a fish, that's going to tell you something 
So that way, the next time you go out, you don't do that. You implement something else. Yeah. So, Danny, kind of go back. <laughs> You've been doing this a long time, and you are an OG. Go back to 10 years ago or so or 15, and, and what was – what do you think has changed? I mean, you you say the sport's growing. Why do you say the sport's growing? It's just the amount of, of people that are out there that um, it's just like peaking. You know, you, you're, you're getting these younger kids involved, Alex, and they see what you're doing and they see how you're doing it. And they're watching you. They watch you come in the weigh-in stations, everything. And – it, it, it's they've grown up to this high. He is one of them. He's he's a perfect institute of what I'm telling you. He watched me. He's he's watched us grow up in this sport, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, just because of the amount of publicity now we're getting, Alex is is a big thing. It really really is. The sponsorship we're getting, the amount of publicity we're getting. It it's. It's been, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's going to grow. It's going to grow. It's going to keep growing. And that's, and that's something I kind of forgot. I was, I was going to mention it. We kind of got off track, but I truly believe like we're at this, we're at this point in this sport where some angler can come in today and make a name for themselves in a huge, huge way. The last two tournaments, Alton and Fort Smith, I've had people, spectators watching that came there to not just watch the weigh-in. They were there to watch certain anglers. One angler wanted Kirk Lucky's autograph, dead serious, at Alton. But Kirk didn't come to the weigh-in. Um, that is where, again, it's important as an angler. If I could give some advice, when it, and that should, we should have a sponsorship <laughs> podcast, you know, and, and how to build, you know, your own brand. But, if you are an angler out there and you want to grow your brand and become somebody in this sport, you, good luck doing it in bass fishing because that's been going on for a long time. We had like, it's wide open in my, in my eyes and cat fishing. We have some great people in the sport, but right now somebody could come in and take the world over. Um, there's some younger kids right now, like Dylan Lawson is doing really, really good. I'm very impressed of what he's doing. But you can come in and take this world over. And that's what's so cool about this sport. Like, I can't wait. In five years, I want to come back to this podcast and see what's changed. Because, like I said, there's there's so many younger people, like you said, getting in. And they're all in. I mean, they're not just doing it for, you know, oh, I'm going to go out with my buddy. I mean, they are, like, spending time watching YouTube videos, you know, spending time on the water scanning instead of just, you know, going hopelessly and throwing – yeah. Baits in the water. So I'm really pumped to see anglers kind of become relevant in our space. And like I said, I would do you guys think that's crazy? Like people are now like somebody wanted Kirk Lucky's autograph. No. It might be because no. he fishes a chicken, but if if you guys can understand anglers that are fishing for catfish, that Tom said, and yeah, come to the way and hold those fish up. Even if you catch a five pound channel cat that fish is you did something show that fish with pride because there's people that are watching you on live at the event and some of them might not say something at this tournament but down the road they'll work the courage up to come talk to you and get an autograph and i'm telling you, like that is a game changer and i am starting to see it for the first time in 10 years my goal again like i said as a director is to build it and getting those spectators to come and I mean, I, nobody's asked for my autograph yet, so maybe someday. But you know what I mean? Like, Tyler, how cool would that be if you're there and somebody, some little kid comes up? It, in Fort Smith, during that video, if you've seen, I held the mic up to a, a little kid that was there all day waiting for the weigh-in, named Brody. Super pumped. Like, he almost, like, had a meltdown with his parents because they wanted to go eat lunch, and he didn't want to miss any of the weigh-in. Like, that, we're there. People can just understand that and like i said like right now anybody that's watching this that wants to get in the sport put your shoes on get ready because i think it's here i really do and mike you know the whole behind the scene aspect of the tournaments that you know you you don't get the chance to because you're busy running the tournaments you know is you know you got 
little rat, you know, that's taking the fish down to release them. You wouldn't believe the amount of kids that are down there, you know, wanting to see them fish, to touch them fish, you know. So my biggest thing is, you know, try to get them interactive as possible. I love to ask little kids, you know, would you like to let these fish go? They feel like Superman, you know, and they get to let a 20-pound fish go. It's just as big as they are, you know. 100%. But that's what, gets, what helps grow. Grow it. Like it's not just about that. Look at how many hours these anglers spend on the water, not during the tournament, just getting bait. Look how far we drive just to get bait, fresh bait. We drive four, five, six hours to fish one tournament on one day. We don't get to go to Bass Pro. You know what I'm saying? We don't get to go to yeah. the bait. We go out and get our own bait. You run more miles getting bait in your boat than what you do the tournament day. Unless you're Kirk Lucky, but yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, like I said, I, that's what's so much fun is watching. I get to watch these anglers. Like now it's that time where they can really run with it. And like I said, there's a few of them that I'm seeing that that really, I mean, you take Phil Brown, he's been doing this a long time. He's got a YouTube channel. You know, he's always commenting. Somebody asks a question, he always gives them an answer. You know, he has nothing to hide. And it's the bass guys aren't really hiding anything. I don't see. I mean, they show everything. They, they're showing your sonar as they're catching fish. But I think that, you know, they have that <clears throat> certain whatever they do on their rod or, you know, their little tricks, you know, but. Like I said, it's uh, it's out there to learn. Anybody can come in the sport. And I, I think we're going to start seeing some other – I think we'll see some crappie anglers and maybe even some bass anglers come into the sport a little bit um, as it's getting bigger and there's more money to be made in it. Not a crappie or catfish, but this isn't like some, you know, backyard weigh-in. I mean, this is starting to get some PR and definitely some big money involved. Well, we're getting, yeah, there it is right there. It, the the <laughs> money gets bigger and bigger because the population and the catfishmen out there are get, is getting bigger and bigger, Alex. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're, getting, you're getting a lot of people in these tournaments and starting to fish tournaments. And I'm not just talking about Twisted Cat. I'm talking about everywhere that are jumping in and realizing this sport is growing so high. That's a Chad said, I'm in the same boat, total dead money, but I'm interested in doing some tournaments. And like I said, it's uh, tournaments. Every angler has their own reason why they do tournaments. And again, I kind of always go back to like, once you get out of school, if you're not great at baseball or basketball, or if you can't golf, what do you, what else can you do? Go fishing. Yeah. Right. There you go. There you go. And you can be competitive and have fun. And just like Colossal <coughs> Cats, Aaron Gerald says, I want my, he wants my autograph on a $20 signed bill. I'm going to get a thing up there with my 20s. And uh, I promise you, come June 2nd, 2nd at about 3 30 in the afternoon, I'm going to have a $20 signed bill from Aaron Gerald. Nice. And I look forward to it. Nice. But that's fun, and that's why I, I, I enjoy those events. Uh, Dylan said, I travel for tournaments because it's like a fun, short vacation every month, sometimes too much fun. So <clears throat> I know Captain Joe owes me two Yo Daddies, so I'm, I still got to collect on them, too. You know, that's... Oh, I forgot about that. You don't forget. You just got to be patient, you know? Who owes me some of those? Does Joe owe me? Probably this he, he owes me from CR last year, and I've just been calmly waiting for the right moment. Who did I make a bet with? And they had no clue what I was told, which do not, I don't even want to say what it is, but <laughs> who, I, where did that come from? I forgot. I watched the video or somebody told me that. It was probably, it was probably the video of us down there at CR uh, last year staying at the house. We all had a big party and we're shooting videos, you know, he was betting everybody in. I didn't really want to get in on it, you know. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm superstitious, very superstitious. And yeah, that's I I'm gonna remember it might be Donald and Nate or it's probably Charles, but somebody owes me some of those. 
Uh, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Bob, Bobby said, cast netting my neighbor's chickens is sounding easier than chasing bait. Bobby what? Lee, I'm telling you right now, Kirk Luck, and I thought it was a joke until they came to New Matter to the weigh-in and they had their empty chicken. You guys seen it, literally. Yeah. They, I mean, that fact, they use chicken. Right. Um, and even Kirk uses chicken, and then once he catches three fish and – Nate catches none on his fresh skipjack. Nate has to go to chicken. Like, it's crazy. Crazy. Alex, I'll tell you what. I've seen a man, a lot of people throw a cast net. And I mean this sincerely. We were down on the Cumberland River. Me, Bobby Lee, Tyler. I have never seen a person throw that big of a net like he did. In my entire life. Ever. Ever. I mean, we're... <laughs> it, it it was unbelievable. I mean, it was it, there was like four four boats down there, and they were all casting for shad. And that Bobby Lee could throw. Bobby Lee could throw that net like no one else. Yeah, yeah, they're they're good. I remember I met them to get something in Burlington once, and they were out getting moon eye. I can't remember where the tournament was from, but. <laughs> incredible i mean they came back with some good moon eye they had them all fresh and they're in the children bait tank and uh yeah them like i said them guys they put in the time yeah and that's what it takes is putting in yeah. the time it does it does and and he just uh, I, I i still try i still have visions about him throwing that net i don't know how big it was i i really don't it was huge it was I mean, I, I don't know how big it was, but I've never seen a net that big. I've never seen a person throw like that guy did. Um, and yeah, I was, I was, I was, I still think about that to this day. <laughs> and that was 2019 when he fished with Tyler, I think. When, wasn't it 19? You fished with Tyler with you down in Cumberland? Probably someone, right? Yeah. yeah. And, but no, he's uh, Bobby. Bobby is uh, Bobby. Bobby's a stand up sportsmanship. Uh, great guy. Yeah. Uh, glad to say he's a good friend of mine. But yeah, he's been to my house many, many times. And uh, no, we uh, we always have a good time we're together. Yeah, I've I've uh, speaking of that, I <clears throat> I need to get back into this. I was doing some angler spotlights, and let's see, I did one with Kyle. down in st louis an angler spotlight so i went out with him and he just kind of went through like what he was doing and all that <laughs> if you get a chance hey, what the, i'm gonna play it at the end of the end of the podcast tonight but um i learned a ton from a few hours in a boat with kyle johnson about bumping and before i went with him you know all i would do is i would go out there and i would just bump like there was no rhyme or reason. I was just bumping down the river and he showed me like what he does, why he does it. I learned a ton in a few short hours and like, that's what it takes. And like I said, just knowing the amount of time he puts in uh, is incredible, but I'll play this little video. Like I said, that's on our YouTube channel, which you have, if you haven't subscribed, that's kind of a crappy plug. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. <laughs> Um, but no, it's a good little video. And like I said, watching videos like that can change how you look at a body of water when you go out, you know, whether it's from bait, looking for fish, all that stuff, instead of just going out blind, throwing your rods in the water, hoping you're going to catch a fish. You know what I mean? So let me ask you, Danny, what is the biggest change you've seen in techniques from 10 years ago, 15 years ago? to today that's changed the sport of catfishing bumping bumping so was there bumping 15 years ago no so never now heard. it's now you, that's what that's what a lot of people do that's all they do and drag baits you know they're dragging baits and bumping you know it's just uh it's it's amazing um I'm old school. You know what I'm saying? I'm still old school. I I, I don't pre-fish. And you know that, Alex. I go out. I'll run a body of water. Now, I'll chart. I'll chart all day long. 
but I don't, I don't put a, I don't put a pole in my, a pole in my boat. I just don't, I, that's me. There's other people out like him that pre-fish, you know, and that's fine. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but no, I think the bumping and the dragging, uh, dragging baits is, uh, is the biggest thing. <laughs> Do you think that if you, if you don't adapt or an angle that doesn't adapt to dragging and bumping, can they still compete against those anglers? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I'm one of them. That's me. I'm old school. Because <laughs> I have old. seen that. I, I've seen that in tournaments where bumping and dragging don't work, and it's been an anchor bite. And uh, for whatever reason that is, and that's you know been the determining factor. And I'm not saying nothing against it. It's it, uh, you, I've heard of people doing. You know, he likes doing it. Um, I'm not a believer in it. That's just me. But no, um, there's 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 guys out there that are. You know, they're phenomenal at it. Phenomenal. But that's their beliefs. They're catching fish. Hey, that's all that matters. You're catching fish. The bottom line, catch fish. But no, I'm just old school, Alex. So, Tyler, what about you? What's What do you think is the biggest technique you've learned over the years that you've been doing this a long time? I'm not going to say you're an OG just because you're too young. But – uh what would you say is the biggest technique or biggest change that's helped you become a better angler over the years? Well, I was stuck on a rope forever, and I learned put the trolling motor down and, and do different things, you know, whether it be drag baits, pump baits, you know, move a bait in some type of a, you know, some type of way. Um, cover, cover as much ground as possible. What about on for both of you? This question is actually from YouTube. What is your your go to if you're going to go out and scan on Friday afternoon or it's Saturday morning and you're going to go scan for fish? What is your go to? Are you going to go out and use your map and side imaging? Or are you going to go out and try to 2D? Or are you just going to go out and look at water? Like, what is your go to on the boat? right before you're trying to find out where you're going to go fishing. I call it charting, Alex. It's called charting. Um, that's a different analogy than a lot of people understand, but I'll, I'll go out there and I'll look on my side imaging and find out where I'm locating fish. And, you know, here's the thing is, Alex, just because they're there that one day, they're, it doesn't mean they're going to be there the next morning. But that's why you chart. You chart for four or five hours that day. And you have to have a lot more than one or two or three or four or five places to go. So that that's my biggest aspect of it. I'll let him dive back. What about you, Tyler? Well, first I'm going to say it depends on what the fish are doing. You know, it, it, just, just by being on the water anywhere gives you a general idea of, of what the fish are doing at that point in time. Um, as far, as far as anything else, I don't know, man, to be honest with you. So, I mean, do you like, when it comes to your sonar, do you like using side scan? Do you like charting? Do you like 2D? Do you believe no, in that? You can't, I don't, I use 2D when I'm shallow. I'm, I'm a very shallow water fisher, you know, I, I like my side scan a lot, but it's not saying that I won't go check out my deep, you know, I, I usually start my way out that's my general theory on things you know and like he said you you figure out what the bait fish are doing and you know your catfish are going to be slowly behind or your stripers or you know anything else that they can be feeding off of so and this is my this is my question so like in my pool i never fish where i catch bait so if there's a hot water discharge and there's always a ton of bait there i never fish there if there's you know, if there's like uh, some barges that are, you know, always in the same spot, I'm always catching bait there. I never fish there. Right. Do you, I, and you always hear like, follow the bait. Yeah. So why am I not fishing there? Should I be fishing there? What's your thoughts on that? Do you fish where you catch your bait? No. Why no. not? 
there because it's just there's you want to get away from where the the the, the, the fish are going to be hungry okay not all the fish can be schooled up around that shad pole or anything else alex you want to find places like you said the barge the sunken barges stuff like that you want to go where the bait fish aren't there you're running fresh bait that day you want to use that bait you want to throw that bait down there because they're them fish are hungry okay they're not schooled up in the shad pool or anything else but no, I I I agree, I agree 100 with you. I I I don't like fishing. The, no, no, not that's not me. Scott, what do you think? I would have to disagree because I've caught a lot of big flatheads off of general areas where you you're finding your bait balls and you know catching your bait and your barges and. But as far as anything like that, I'd say I'd rather try to find a travel corridor to where they're coming from. They're not just staged up where the bait is. They're coming from somewhere to there to feed. So you want to try to try to find the happy medium in between there. Those are some good answers. And then Chad, <coughs> Chad saying, Tyler, what size weight do you use on average for when you're bumping? I try to use as minimal as possible. I cannot say a size because it depends on the body of water. You know, uh, just for example, out here on the Illinois River, I, I could be one day with the dam down, I could be using a quarter ounce. And if we got current, I could be using a three or four ounce. You know, uh, I'm going to go with as light as possible, though, no matter what. And it's the same way a lot of people make fun of me. Um, I like long limb rods for my channel catfishing, and I'll eat. I've always used 12, 14 pound test. You know, everybody's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I would rather get that bite and have to worry about getting into the boat than have to worry about trying to beg for a bite. As natural as appearance that you can get, I've always been told it's the best. That's a really, that's really good. Cause I mean, even if I fish, you know, I fish a lot of blues and channels, but I use the same gear for the most part. I'll try to go down to a medium rod, but I'll still have 80 pound braid because I'm using the same reels. So do you think if you're going and you're fishing for those 10 pound channel cat in shallow water that having 80 pound mono or, or braid that thick yellow, or, and you get this bright colors, does that affect you think the fish? Big, big time. Just like stiff rods. I feel like, you know? yeah, um, we we'll run eight footers, me and Tyler, um, channel catfish and we're running eight foot, nine foot, nine foot rods. Um, and it's not that those guys won't catch fish, you know, but the productivity all in all, you're going to get more bites. And not only the more natural than these, you know, these big, you know, broomstick rods or, you know, big heavy rods with, as you were saying, so 50 you're definitely using some lighter tackle for channel cats are you using lighter tackle in march for channel cats or the, are you using the same tackle in march for channel cats that you are in september for channel cats absolutely and you know just like i i had you live you know i was showing you videos down there at uh oklahoma you know that's what we were using channel cat here that's all that was you know that was nine foot medium light rods Open face. I mean, reels. those tips. I I watched it. You 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 was uh, you were facetiming me, <coughs> and you said you could see me. But I was like, that's crazy. Like your rods are buried in the water. Like I mean, that was wild. And I Not, mean, that's that's some good. Anybody watching, that's some really good information. You know, well, sometimes what they're saying is that they if you have that eight foot medium heavy or heavy that you might use for blue cat fishing, but you're trying to use both for both species. Maybe that channel cat is going to come up and bite that bait, but it's going to just feel so much resistance. Well, the blues, the blues were so gorged down there that they didn't have to eat. You know what I mean? They were just picking it up and putting it in their mouth and swimming with it to have it, you know, is, is my personal thoughts. Because, I mean, I felt like you could take a needle to their bellies and they would have just been like, a boom, you know? 
they were they were fully gorged. They didn't have to eat, so they'd start swimming, and you know we weren't hardly running a weight at all. You know, long leader, and all of a sudden you just watch that line be swimming, and you be just enough with that circle up to just start folding the rod. You know, just a little bit of a reel down, and the fight was on. You know, it's fun. You know, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to have fun. Yeah, and you Alex, had a lot of fun. Watched you. You had two fish on at once. <laughs> well, and Alex. It's not only that is when you got a day where they're, I, I call it just they're holding bait, like Tyler just talked about. They're nudging the bait. They're nubbing the bait. You got a long pole. Okay. You got a nine foot rod compared to a seven foot rod. Guess what? One gives them more leniency. You tell me. Yeah. All right. There's when you got a light bite. It's there's a big big difference. I'm sorry. I I I, I believe in it. Maybe other people don't, but big big difference. When they can do take you, that, that pole do down. You, are those are these two piece rods you guys are using? No. Yes. Yeah. What, what, no. Yes, I got two piece. Okay. I got one. That's interesting. That's some good info. What about reels? What reels were you guys using for channel cats? I'm using pen. And I use Okumas. Like a smaller Okuma? Like a, what's... Just a small Okuma with a bait runner, you know. Um, like I said, it varies between 12 and 14 pound test. When I go over to Burlington, I like to have, you know, usually a 14. And then when I'm over here, I might pull off this with a 12 all day long. And, you know, I sent you pictures last year of, you know, 28s, you know, then blues and flats, you know. And that don't scare me. That's all just mental. So you're, you're using braid? No, mono. Mono. Just because you want that little stretch. Yep. That's what you yeah, want. You, I agree, but you got then you got people like Charles Birdness Blair that he can't <laughs> cast. Him. He can't. You got mono on a reel for him. He's gonna. It's gonna be able to use that reel. Have to throw it away. Hey, on the reel. Where's he? On the real, where's old big cat then? He ain't chimed in at all. He's probably still in bed. Oh, geez. Probably still in bed. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> no, man. Uh, that's a big thing. If anybody has any questions, reach out to all of us. You know, we're all willing to help people that want to and learn, you know, how to catfish or what, you know. Definitely. I love to oh. take see the smile on their face you know it's because they don't get to do that that they have a misperception of catfishing you just throw a pole and you sit on the bank and you wait well i like and it that's when, it and I that's like a thing like back to when i go to the cities that's what people think is they think it's just like you know you're just fishing from the bank and you know you're just out there partying it's it's like it this is serious this is i mean there's a lot of fast action going on and you were saying about bass fishermen, you know, wanting to come over and fish. You know, I took a lot of bass fishermen out last year that just were like, this is a ball, you know. Can we do this again? Can we do this again, you know? And I'm taking them out two, three, four times a week, you know. And it's just because I love to see the smile on their face, you know. And it, 100%. It, see somebody doing something they don't get to do. Really is. Yeah. Well, and Alex, I took, a, I took a bass fisherman out too. We went up and we were up north. And uh, he's never fished a catfishing tournament. And he actually li lived at the time three houses down from me. And we took second place. And the guy was nonstop all the drive home just going, I can't believe we did. I cannot believe we did. I can't believe that. I, you know, it's, it's the thrill. It's the thrill of it, you know. And they, everybody, you know, they say anybody can catch a fat catfish. True. That's true. Once you get out and you run these tournaments and you get in their tournament range, you're it's totally different. It's 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 it, it, it puts something in here, you know, it's right here. Oh, 100 percent. Just like Hamilton said, show them what big fish are all about. And that's I, I love taking people out. I've taken some people from my town out um, that just say, hey, there's the catfish guy. I mean, I live in a town of 1900 people, but. They're, they're the enjoyment of watching them catch a fish. I remember Nate Bardo, you're probably on here watching, comment on this. <clears throat> His first time really on a boat, he did a lot of fishing from the bank. Watching him catch them big flatheads, 
you you can't it doesn't get better than that like i I'll, i don't even care about catching the fish anymore it's like taking that angler out and watching them struggle the rod tip gets buried in the water like that to me is yeah. so much fun so much fun yeah yeah no, wait. i got videos nate so i'm i'm gonna i have to i gotta play and make a real one of those videos but i mean nate had a blast it was so much fun watching him and now he's fishing tournaments there and you go. He, he went there all you go. in he's 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 chasing and he's looking about he's checking recipes with kool-aid and all this yeah he that's an a said nothing better than catching a big catfish and like i said watching him that for the first time on a boat catch that big flathead i think it was like 40 some pounds incredible like it's just so i mean it was just so much like that's what it's about um <clears throat> So I am going to play this quick video. Any, what else you got? You guys got any little tips or tricks you'd like to – anything else that we missed tonight? No, and like I said, if anybody thinks of anything, feel free to reach out to any of us. You know, we're nothing nothing but help, and we want to help. Yeah, 100%. If you're watching and you guys got questions in this podcast, comment. Uh, you know, Tyler and Danny will see these comments. They'll uh, respond. Reach out to them personally. Again, you know, our goal is to bring value at these podcasts. Um, and I think we do it at every one. And that's, like I said, that's what's fun about it. And these guys, like I said, I remember when I first got in the sport and I was wanting to buy a Sea Arc Easy 200. I had had an old pontoon, fished a few tournaments. And I remember I went down to the St. Louis Boat Show and Ryan Casey had his booth set up and I had like looked up to Ryan. I was like, man, I've been watching Ryan. Like it's, this is awesome. And I was like, I was too scared to go up and talk to him like that first time. And uh great guy. And like, once you get to know the, a lot of these anglers, I mean, it's like I said, there's so many good people in the sport uh, that are willing to help out. You know what I mean? Phil Brown's, like I said, he's got a lot of videos on how to's. <laughs> a lot of these guys are willing to. That Tyler Barnes you had on, you Tyler, know, Oh, that guy seems like he, you know, he's a basket full of knowledge and the greatest guy to meet in the world. And I, you know, can't wait. I seen he's registered for the CR. You know, one person I look forward to, you know, you know. Alex, I'm going to get off here. I thank you for your time. Um, you, 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 you are doing a wonderful job in running this tournament trail. I mean that sincerely. Thank you. And uh, wish you all well. But I look forward to seeing uh, everybody in Pekin, Illinois. Memorial Day weekend. I thank you. And tight lines to everyone. Yeah, thanks for being on. We'll do it again, Danny, before we go. Thanks again, Danny Sapp. He's been instrumental to bring this big event to Pekin for the second year, May 25th. And again, Doug asked about uh, – Milford, we're going to try to have Benji Stoller on next week uh, for our May 4th Milford tournament. That's going to be a big event, too. At a, out, uh, We're going to do a Friday night thing at Acorns. So, like I said, four tournaments in. We got a lot. We got eight left for Twisted Cat. And then also, uh, we'll be a part of the Sea Arc Owners events, Alton Classic, Fishing for Freedom. So, we're going to be busy, 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 busy this year. Uh, hopefully, I'll see Tyler at a lot of these events. But for those of you watching, um yeah. and just a few minutes you huh? will be with me for the Pekin tournament old phil really? yes sir the old old phil awesome. oh gee so good that's what i like to see that's um for so for those of you watching i'm gonna i just i got two questions for you number one who would you like to see on the podcast in the future is there an angler is there anybody special you'd like to see on the podcast and number two who would you like to see me do a an angler spotlight like i'm gonna play with kyle johnson gosh i kind of think what year that was it's been a while it'll, it'll play in the video um so who would you like to see on the podcast comment who would you like to see an, me do an angler spotlight with comment um watch this quick video i'm gonna share it and then we're gonna come right back uh and then me and tyler will finish this up but uh, watch this and tell me what you think. And again, while you're watching it in the comments, put who you'd like to see on the podcast and who you'd like to see a uh, angler spotlight with.
Here's the angler spotlight I did with Mr. Kyle Johnson. And it's only about three minutes long. Once we play it, we'll come back and then discuss it. So let's get that going. A rock ledge. All right, we're just scanning this ledge. Um, it's a rock ledge. Looking for pieces of wood stuck to the edge of it. Looking for single fish uh, stuck to structure. They found a couple. Uh, nothing real impressive, but we got we got one right at the bottom of the ledge here. We marked. You zoom in, you see some bottom separation on him. There might be one or two fish right there. Probably a little bigger one. You see the ledge off here to our right. We're getting a little too far away from it. Idea is to drop waypoints along this thing and try to try to connect the dots with the GPS and try to hit every one of these. Maybe it'll produce more than one. Fish on side scan on sand dunes. We're gonna see if we can go catch a few. We got a good line plotted up. See if we can put a few in the boat. If we marked on the sand, had a taker after about 10 minutes. Good fish. We uh, scanning for some fish. Marked the I don't know a dozen fish on side scan on sand dunes. Made a made a path. Got up above them. Started bumping. About ten minutes. This one took took the bait. We get him back and we'll see if we can go make another pass and pick up one of the other ones we marked. Had a good day today, bumping downtown St. Louis. Only caught five fish. It was a bit of a rough bite for us today, but learned a few, learned some new water. Got Tony a fish bumping today. Had to play with some new toys in the boat. All right, guys. So it was a great day today. I want to thank Kyle Johnson for coming out, um, taking me out down here, and kind of being the first in our angler spotlight. So I plan on doing this. Um, about once a month, taking anglers out that fish the Twisted Cat Outdoors Tournament Series and kind of just seeing what they do, why they do it, and maybe uh, we can each learn a little bit from each one of these guys. So hope you enjoyed watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. That was some amazing editing, by the way, right? That was good. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Any if you watch that and you really listen, there's a few really good things you can pick up on uh, that Kyle does. And like I said, that was several years ago. So I need to get back in that angler spotlight. That's really fun. Um, so I'll start doing that. But like I said, if you're watching this, whether it's live or not, uh, post who you'd like to see on the podcast and do an angler spotlight like we just did there. Um, and again, Tyler and Danny, thank you so much for being on tonight. And Tyler, so are you, what do you think, points-wise? You going to have it in the bag, you think? Bro, you, you I'm going to I'm gonna give it a run. And I, I told Mike, honestly, I said, it ain't about the top 50. You know, I, it'll be great to make it. But I, I want top 10. You know, I'm greedy. You know, I want to be up there, and I want a chance when we go down to uh, Missouri down there for the championship that, you know, I got a shot. Or Helena, I'm sorry, Helena, I believe, right? Yeah, hell no. So, I mean, like I said, it's uh, we've got four tournaments in, eight left, uh, and the best four events. So, like I said, technically somebody could come in tournament eight and jump in the top ten. You know what I mean? That's what's that's what's cool. 
Um, and a lot of changes will happen. A lot of anglers only got some that have four in the top. But again, some that got two, maybe three. If you look at some of their results, you know, when are they going to come get that fourth or that third? So um, the goal is the best of the best. Uh, as I said in that video right here, it's actually, if I can share that screen. I've been saying this for a long time. And you know that too. Let's see. Right there leave the excuses on the water absolutely um absolutely. so like i said it's fun can't wait if you have any questions at all about anything we got coming up shoot me a message again if you don't follow us on youtube for rhett's sake uh subscribe and uh like i said we're gonna have a lot more content coming out on youtube uh from installing power poles and the paddles and why and and how we're using them and, and a lot of how to's and then hopefully some angler spotlights coming up again. So uh, look forward to doing that too. Everybody, thank you so much for watching, Tyler. Uh, again, thank your dad and yourself for being on. I appreciate it. It was a good hey, show. Thank you guys. Hey, tell Red I said happy birthday. Man, we missed him. Can't wait to see him. Is he gonna be is he gonna come to Pekin again this year? Oh yeah, he'll be at Pekin, hundred percent. Yeah, he'll be in almost all the events, I think. Uh he might miss Milford, but other than that, he'll be at the events and trying to get him uh hopefully i get to fish a few tournaments with him this year too so i'm excited about that would be cool that'd be really cool yeah so again uh tyler thanks for being on everybody thank you for watching our monday night live podcast on youtube and facebook again subscribe to youtube make sure you follow us and hopefully we see you at one of our events coming up and that's it oh, where is it turn there you go you're gonna make him happy all right, we're out. Have a good See week. Ya. Thank you.